Good morning. So good to see you. Welcome to service today. Take your hymn book, page number 526. One of the great rock solid songs for the church. The solid rock. Let's stand. Let's sing about our great Savior and the rock that he is. Lift your voice now in our great hope. Father, we thank you so much that indeed we can stand upon the rock that Christ is. Father, thank you so much that when Christ stood on that rock, he said upon him he will build the local New Testament church. And Father, we thank you that we are part of that church right here in South Florida. Thank you, Lord, for calling us to, to, to have a, make a difference right here in our community, Lord. And Father, I just thank you that through your word we can know how your love is for us. Father, thank you for redeeming us in such a way and paying the penalty of our sin. Father, thank you that through your word we can know that you want to you wanna commune with us. And Father, we give you praise for that. Lord, I pray that you would meet with us in a great way and, and uh, just rejoice our hearts like your word promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn around and greet those around you. And as you come back, remain standing. He indeed is Lord. He is risen from the dead. One day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. You know the great little chorus. Lift your voice now. He is Lord.
God bless you. You may be seated. I trust you know him as your Lord and Savior. And uh, what a joy it is to have already bowed our hearts to his great lordship in recognition of that wonderful day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So good to see us. So many guests here today and uh, folks, uh, friends and family that have been traveling are back and some we haven't seen in a while and you're here and what a delight it is to be in the house of God this morning. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, in the pew in front of you is a connection card. If you'd reach out, grab that card, fill it out, put it in the offering plate when it goes by. That'll give us a record of your attendance today. We uh, love to get those to learn how you heard about our church. Uh, we'll reach out maybe with a phone call and uh, some kind of opportunity there to make ourselves available to you. And we just want to say welcome to Plantation Baptist Church. While they're doing that, filling out the card, let me make some announcements. Don't forget our service tonight at 6 o'clock. Our Sunday evening service is a tremendously inspirational service. Uh, tonight we have three men that have been saved and they will be water baptized inside our church. And so we're excited about that. It's always great to have the baptismal waters stirred and we'll rejoice there. Also, we have a missionary guest with us, um, Bill and Judy Fortner. Fortners, raise your hand if you would. They've been attending our church for some time and uh, they have a wonderful mission to Romania. Is that, is that, that's right. It deals with children and orphanages and churches and ministry there. Uh, Brother Fortner has pastored in South Florida um, many, many moons ago, as the, uh, they would say. But um, you got a great history there, and you're going to enjoy the, the fresh vision that God has on their heart, and they're going to present that tonight. I trust that you'll be there. I believe a table is set up in the lobby, and they'll be there after the service, and you can come by and greet them accordingly. Uh, the bulletin is dominated by our fall festival announcement and of course, we have our fall festival the first Friday of November. This is a community outreach, evangelistic in nature. This is where we invite um, our neighbors, our friends, our families with, um, with, that have children, say, from preschool up to about the fifth grade. We set up the uh, uh, west side of the building with all kinds of old-fashioned games that we used to play and have hot dogs and refreshments and just a wonderful time. And there's a sweet spirit. There's always a sweet spirit when we meet in church, but there's an extra sweet spirit on fall festival night. Now, we need volunteers from our church family, so we've put these cards out. They're at the welcome desk as well. Please, if you have not, volunteer to help us. Um, I will say the later you wait to volunteer, the more nasty job that you will get. And so we do that on purpose, and uh, I'm just kidding you about that, but sign up and do that. There's a fall festival workers meeting on um, next Sunday night after the evening service at 7 o'clock. All kinds of announcements there. Ladies in prayer this Tuesday. Of course, our Wednesday night service, Senior Saint Luncheon. We have a deacons meeting this week. All the way down now to the Thanksgiving season. People are asking about Christmas already. We've begun to set up the Christmas lights. Pretty soon we'll be looking for volunteers there. Christmas lights go on Thanksgiving night, Lord willing. We're not going to run them every night of the week this year at the beginning. We're only going to run them on the weekends. And then as we get closer to Christmas, we'll run them at, uh, every day of the week. Um, but we're looking forward to that. People are already asking me about Christmas Eve service. I Probably you've already bought Christmas presents. Is there anybody that's strange and unusual and you've already bought a Christmas present? Okay, some of you got problems and you come forward at the end of the service today and we'll be delighted. Um, on Christmas Eve day, which is a Sunday, we will have a morning service at 10.30, evening service at 5 o'clock. Morning service will be a, a worship service. The 5 o'clock will be our candlelight Eve service. So there will be two services that day, one at 10.30 and one at 5 o'clock. So the schedule will come out and we'll be able to keep abreast of all of that and to be a blessing. Speaking of blessing, men, thank you for coming to our men's activity yesterday. We went up to Quail Creek Plantation. We did some skeet shooting. We had a wonderful time. If you were not there, you were missed. And um, I, I just got good news for these two sections today. My right arm is killing me from shooting that shotgun all day yesterday. 
so you will not feel any conviction. I will have to use my left hand to point at the sinners today, and you folks are in trouble because you're going to get a double dose. But uh, we had a marvelous time as, as brothers in Christ, and uh, if you couldn't make that one, look for some more opportunities as well. We serve a great God, amen? And so listen to the choir. They're going to exalt his greatness in this medley. Sing the greatness of our God. God bless you, choir.
He's worthy to be praised. I think page number 718 follows an anthem like this in a very personal way. As you sit there and you listen to the greatness of our God sung in medley, I don't want you to forget that as great as he is in, in himself, he's also great in a very personal and intimate way in our lives, in the moments of our lives. And I, I love this hymn. I do not believe there is a better hymn in the hymn book that prepares our hearts for the preaching of the Word of God than this hymn day by day. It takes us through, as the author has written, and she brings us through the moments of our lives, day by day and with each passing moment. Strength, I find, to meet my trials here. She understands trials. She understands what it is to trust in her Father's wise bestowment. How there's no reason for worry or for fear. Because the heart of our God is kind beyond all measure. She talks about how he orchestrates the days of our lives and brings into our, our lives lovingly pain and pleasure and works that according to peace and rest. I love verse number two. Every day, the Lord himself is near me. Praise the Lord for that. With special mercy and cares for me and that will lift me and cheer me as counselor and power. Understanding the intimacy of our Lord and that wonderful relationship. Verse number three, help me. Help me, God, in every tribulation to trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose not face sweet consolation. I believe if you will allow the truth of this hymn to, to find lodging in your heart, it'll prepare you for the preaching of the word of God. Preaching a very personal message today. I need God to prepare your heart with this song. Pay attention as you lift your voice. I pray it'll bless you. Stand if you would. Let's sing about God's faithful presence in the moments of our lives. Day by day and with its passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in so singing. 
before we have our prayers of the people, some of you are visiting with us, may not know that our children's ministry, the junior churches are already meeting. If you have a child up through the fifth grade, uh, you, they can exit that back door. You can take them to the class. The classes are there. I just feel in my spirit that we need to give God glory for answered prayer because Brother Philip Churchill is with us today. And uh, he was at death's door, and he's here today by the grace of God. And I just, would you welcome him to our service and give God glory for that? <laughs> Philip knows about the moments of life and finding God faithful. It's our offering time. Thank you for being faithful there. Church, don't forget our Faith Promise missionary cards today. We got a responsibility to take the gospel around the world, and we talked about this. Today's the day we were going to collect our cards. I trust you're ready. If not, you can turn them in later. But a lot of work to be done, a lot of people that need the Lord. And so thank you for your faithfulness there. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, God, I love that hymn. That hymn does something in my spirit. It does something in the depth of my heart, my soul. I heard an old preacher say one time in defense of the hymns, he said, there's nothing wrong with the hymns. There's just something wrong with the way we sing them. I, 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 I latched on to that. Now I sing them with concentration and understanding and appreciating what the message of that hymn. And man, I was reading that and thinking about that in my life. Day by day with each passing moment as you deal in our lives. You come to us with new assurance. You never leave us nor forsake us. You work the things out lovingly, pain and pleasure in my life. I, I love that line. It says where you laid upon yourself the charge of protecting us and caring for us. No man can ever say about you, God, that you're found to be unfaithful for you are faithful, God. So I thank you for that, Lord. I want to praise your holy name for Philip Churchill being here today. I want to lift high the name of Jesus, the great physician. I want to give you glory and praise. Thank you for his wife and the blessing they are. And truly, he's here today because the good hand of God is upon his life. Lord, there are other folks in the room today, and they have needs and trials and going through things. And I just pray today, God, that they would find that peace and that rest and that strength and that security and that encouragement in the person of their Savior. Lord, we talked about every day he comes to me with new assurance and he's ever near us. I, I'm, I'm praying that we reckon that today in our lives. Help me preach the message today. Very personal message, very simple message, but I do believe, God, a message that if we will allow, it can bring us to wonderful, wonderful newness in Christ. And so help me. Lord, today we collect our faith promise cards. And this is Plantation Baptist Church saying we believe in biblical missions. And we want to be found faithful in this area. And so we've made ourselves available in our person and our time and our talent and our treasure. And so I pray that you would receive that for a blessing. Thank you for our church family. All over the world today is our church family. Would you watch over them? Care for us. Keep us close to you, God. Thank you that nothing can ever separate us from your love. Lift us in our spirits today. We truly love you. Thank you for loving us first. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. If you are our guest today, if you would please put that card in a plate. Listen to one of the great hymns ever written, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wrench like me. lost but now I am found 
I was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers toils and snares I have already come this grace has brought me safe thus far and grace feel the Spirit of God in that song. I love when she sings that third verse. You actually feel in the, in the singing of that, the troubles and trials of life, and then coming in with the great victory in the Lord Jesus. If you have your Bibles this morning, would you please find the 24th chapter of the book of Joshua. I know the bulletin says the 23rd. That's my fault. The 24th chapter of the book of Joshua will be our text this morning. I don't believe we will leave the book of Joshua. We might turn a couple of pages here or there, but we'll find ourselves in this great book. One of uh, uh, these, our text here this morning, Joshua chapter 23 and chapter 24, are two very familiar chapters in the Bible. Uh, if you've been saved for a while or if you grew up in a church and you've heard preaching consistently in your life, I'm sure that you have heard messages from the 23rd and 24th chapters of the book of Joshua. Sometimes, as a pastor, you tend to shy away from familiarity in the Scripture. And sometimes you think about a message, and maybe God leads you to a message, and then you'll hear a little voice that says, well, they already know that. Or it's very familiar, and, and so I find uh, sensitivity there, and sometimes I shy away from that. And, but this time, I, I just felt 
that God wanted us to visit this verse, and he made it very known to me. I, um, I do my studying for messages and preaching at the house. I'm the kind of guy, when I study, nobody can be in the house. They all got to go away. Beverly says, I'm in the bedroom. I say, you're bothering me. I'm not, you, know, you don't even hear me. You're in the house. You got to go. She says, I want to talk to the Lord about this. I says, no, you got to go talk to him out there. But I need the house to study. I do my studying at the kitchen table. I find that we don't eat a lot at the kitchen table. We eat a lot at the kitchen couch. Do you have a kitchen couch at your house? But we, I do my studying at the kitchen table. And um, I'm old-fashioned. I lay out books. You, you, don't, you, you millennials, you don't know what books are. Um, anyway, you'll find out about it. But I lay out my books, and I take up the whole table, and I make a big mess, and, and I kind of walk around that table and go from point to point. And sometimes as you sit there, the, the Lord just gives you the message faster than what you can take it. He says, Lord, you got to slow it down. And, and sometimes you get so full in your preparation that I just got to walk. Do I have any other pacers here. When you talk on the phone, you pace like crazy. I wear a little watch sometimes and it tells me about my steps. And depending on how many phone calls I get that day, I reach my goal or I don't reach my goal. But I am a, a pacer. And so I get up and I, I walk around and work my way through it and sit back down and write it up. And, and is anybody that teaches a lesson, whether you preach a message or teach in a school or teach whatever, you can always judge how your lesson is going to be as to your prep time. And if you're blessed it personally in your prep time, you usually know it's going to be a good lesson when it comes out publicly. And so I was very, very blessed in my prep time and study time with the Lord. And so I have been excited to preach to you this message. Our text is found in the 24th chapter. If you would please go to the verse number 14. Joshua chapter 24, verse number 14. The first word is the word now. I just want you to remember that word when we sing the invitation song. That word is going to come up again in our invitation song. Joshua says, now therefore fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods, notice, small g, which means false gods, idols. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But, say those next three words if you would please. As for me, as for me. And I want to stop right there. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in a home with a pastor. I got saved as a little boy. I grew up in church my whole life. I know the last part of that verse just like you do. I know the last part of that verse says, and as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As I was preparing for the message, when I got to those words, but as for me, I could go no further. The Spirit of God stopped me and the Spirit of God brought my concentration to those three little words. So I'm preaching you a message today, as for me. This text is found when Joshua is communicating to the nation. If you look at verse number 29, you will understand in just a few verses, Joshua will be dead. The Bible says that he died as the servant of the Lord, being 110 years old. These two chapters are the final words that Joshua gives to the nation. He's preparing the nation to go on without him. Joshua has been a faithful leader to the nation of Israel. He is the one that filled the shoes of Moses as the God called men to come behind. He is the one that met them on the other side of Jordan and was the one that brought them across into Jordan. He is the leader that God used to conquer the nations of Canaan. He is the man that God used to divide to the nation of Israel their inheritance. And Joshua, as I find him in the word of God, I have found him to be a faithful man. I preached to you last week a message 
on faithfulness. I preached to you about the requirement that the Apostle Paul said about how a steward is to be found to be faithful. I preached to you about the need for men to be faithful, how the need for the servants of the Lord and the church of Christ to be faithful. I talked to you about that in the, for the future of our church, for the future of the gospel, for the future of the way that you and I believe. And God met with us last week, and I, I dare say that Joshua is a faithful man. He finds himself in this charge to the nation, bearing out his heart. He finds himself here in the depth of his soul, loving them. And he's making a personal application. And he's letting them know that they have a choice in their life. They have a choice in what way they're going to go. They as a nation can go this way and serve the gods of the Canaanites, which would be false gods. Or they can determine in their heart and their mind and their life that they're going to serve the true and the living God. Here is this man, faithful, great leader, reverenced and respected, speaking to millions of people, and yet speaking on his own behalf, speaking for himself. And in in essence, he says this, men, ladies, you can do what you want to do. But as for me, and I have been so dominated by these three words, as for me, because I do believe now after 23 years of being in the ministry and 23 years of working with people, if I could reduce down in a, in a, in a summation of success versus non-successful part of a spiritual life, a joyful life, a life walking with the Lord, a life blessed by the Lord. I do believe that you could reduce life as difficult and as changing as it is. You you can reduce it down to the moments in your life where you had to make a decision as for you, personal as for you. My dear friends today, I hope you understand That at the end of your life, you will stand before no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will have to give an account for your life. You will not stand before me, nor will I stand before you. We will stand together. You will not stand before the great leaders of this world, the presidents of our nation, or men of esteem and respect. At the end of humanity, every man and every woman will stand before the true and living God. And you're going to have to give an account for yourself. You think about that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I never have to give an account for my sin. That's been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But I do have to give an account for how I organized and orchestrated and how I lived my life. This is very personal to me because as I think of the moments of my life, there were some times in my life when I came to this very important, crucial decision process in my life, where I had a lot going on, and a lot of influence from without, and basically, the Lord brought me to a decision as to what am I personally going to do. I met my wife when I was 17 years of age. I met her in high school. When I met Beverly, she loved the Lord with all her heart, mind, and soul, and she lived like it. When I met her, I knew the Lord, but I don't know that I loved him with all my heart, mind, and soul. As a 17-year-old girl, she knew enough to pray for me. I remember I was in a youth conference, and a preacher was preaching, and and he was preaching on the subject of what are you going to do with your life. And I remember sitting there in that message, and I remember listening and and taking inventory of where I was as a 17-year-old senior in high school getting ready to graduate. And I knew my life wasn't where it should have been with the Lord. And I knew that I was not what God wanted me to be, nor was I headed where God wanted me to be. And I remember dealing with with influence in my life. And I was seated there in uh, in that auditorium in Pontiac, Michigan. And it really did boil down to, as for me, as for me, What am I going to do with the Lord? What decision am I going to make? Forget all the outside influence. Tom, 
What are you going to do? I went to Bible college, and I remember my freshman year, God was calling me to full-time ministry. I knew it in my heart. I was fighting it so heavy and so bad, and just was wrong in fighting it, but I knew I was. And I was sitting, forgive me, balcony, where all sinners sit, in the very last row of the balcony. Just kidding about that. And God, once again, confronted me. Tom, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do with your life? I remember moving forward, even as I was married and would come to opportunities and things. It, it seemed like as difficult as life got, it always got reduced down to what do you want to do, Tom? What decision are you going to make? It was very easy to always find excuses in the outside influences of our lives. But I need you to understand this morning that you will never stand before those outside influences and you will never stand with them when it comes to this moment, but you will have to stand before God and give an account of yourself. And here's what Joshua is saying. Joshua is saying, fellas, you can go where you want to go and do what you want to do. But as for me, I find myself as the pastor working with people constantly. And I, feel my, I find myself making a statement often. And the statement goes something like this. If you go with the Lord on this, you will survive. If you go with the Lord on this, you will survive. So I have singles that come to me and they come to me and they're dating and falling in love and wanting to be married and get married to unsaved people and I know that their heart is wrenched and they have a genuine love for this and I'm as their pastor, I'm begging them, please don't do this. It's against God's word. And I tell them, listen, if you'll trust God on this, you'll survive. I have people that want to make decisions and the outside influence takes them away from the authority of the Bible. And I just say, listen, if, if, if you'll go with God on this, you'll survive. I have husbands and wife and they come and they're at the point of divorce and, and there's, just, there's just selfishness just from the top to the bottom. And I'll look at a husband and wife in the same room and I'll say, listen, you guys can either come to the Lord individually and survive this or one of you can go with the Lord and survive this, and the other one can run. But whoever goes with the Lord will survive. I didn't say you wouldn't suffer. And I didn't say it wouldn't be difficult. But sometimes, church, you come to the moments of your life when it's just you and a God. And you've got to make a decision for yourself. And I want you to know that Jesus is the right decision every time. I can give you some examples. Are you really going to go to hell? Are you really willing to go to hell? Sometimes I meet people and I, I preach to them week after week after week, year after year after year. And, and they know the gospel. They know the truth. They know themselves to be a sinner. They know they need to be saved. They know they need to be born again. And they hear it and they hear it. But, but sometimes there's just this outside influence and whatever that's pulling them. And I just want to grab them and say, this is about you. As for you, what do you want to do? Sometimes people comfort themselves in the fact of hell and that there will be others there. Have you ever read the Bible about hell? Do you understand that hell is a place of darkness? You understand you won't see in hell. You'll be completely devastated and blinded by the darkness. You understand that hell is a place of flame and torment and, and, and there's no peace or sanity in that moment. Do you understand that the only thing that the Bible says you will hear, hear in hell is the scream and torment of gnashing teeth? I used this example in the first service and I'll use it again. I, I, I want to step out here and give my opinion. I'm not preaching from the pulpit. I'm going to give you my opinion here just a second. You can flush this or keep it or not. To me, horror movies, most of the horror movies that we see today are nothing but demonism. That's right. This is my opinion. And they make these horror movies, and they're filled with demonism that's in the Bible. And if you watch a horror movie, there's usually this scream or this shrill that's not normal. 
That scream and that shrill that's not normal is because it comes from a demonic influence there. By the way, did you ever notice that most of the actors that act in these horror films end up killing themselves? Why? Because it's filled with demonism. I want to step back in now as your pastor and say this. That is the shrill that will be for all eternity in a place called hell. I would rather hear the song of the redeemed. And I look at people and I say, listen, uh, as for you, in my pastoral counseling, I, I very rarely ever pass, counsel um, a lady to go against her husband. I very rarely do that. Sometimes, even if there's one saved spouse and one unsaved spouse, if the unsaved spouse doesn't want the saved spouse to attend church as faithful or tithe or, or they want them to do certain. I'm very careful about how I work in that because I want to maintain a reverence and a respect there and for God to work. But Jesus himself said, I would not let my spouse, I would let not my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, I wouldn't let anybody keep me from being born again because heaven and hell are real places. And I'm asking you, what about you? Joshua says, fellas, if you want to go to hell, go to hell. But as for me, I want the Lord. And I'm trying to get you to see how simple life really does reduce down to. It reduces down to what decision are you going to make for yourself? Job, probably the oldest book in the Bible, Job, one of the earliest men to ever walk the face of the earth, who knew tests and trials and, and devastation and, 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 and all of this as no other man did. His wife looked at him and his friends looked at him and said, Job, in the midst of all of this, why don't you just curse God and die? I would like to submit to you that there has never been a man on the earth that has a legitimate excuse to curse God, right. ever. And yet, Sometimes we go through the depths of trials and heartache and, and life unfolds and, and, and we're not able to explain it. But in the hymn, we talked about how God unfolds life lovingly with pain and pleasure and he works in our, our lives. And, and, and sometimes the outside influence is just, just so de demanding and dominating and it, it is able to direct you. But, but really and truthfully, how you survive your trial and your test in the midst of that depends on what do you decide. Yes, you can curse God and die in the midst of this, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to trust him no matter what. I'm going to stay faithful to him. I'm going to lean on him. He loves me. I know him. He's faithful. He's within me. And my, but as for me, I'm going to trust the Lord. Quitting. I told the service at 8.30, some of my friends in the ministry are beginning to quit one by one. They're beginning to give in. I know quitting always looks like it's the easy thing to do and everybody else looks like they're going to quit. But really and truthfully, it boils down to what are you going to do? What do you want God to do in your life? When Jesus was giving them the, the gospel and giving them the truths in the New Testament, many of his disciples went away. He looked at Peter and he said, are you going to go away also? Are you going to go away also? Joshua said, if you want to quit, quit. You want to curse God and die, curse God and die. You want to go away also, go away also. But as for me, now class, listen. That's the Christian life. I wrote something on my paper. I wrote it down messy, and I've asked the Spirit of God to help me with this. Please don't miss this. The personal presence of the Lord in your life should be a living and powerful motivation for you to walk with him consistently. I want to ask you this question, and don't freak out on me. I hate the word feel, but I got to use it here. Do you feel God's presence in you? If so, would you say amen? amen. When I got saved, the Spirit of God came into my life. He lives inside of me. And... He talks with me all the time. 
He walks with me all the time. He, he, he lets me see him in the maneuvering of my life. And, and I don't know how to explain it to you other than to say that I have a personal relationship with God. He knows my name. He, he knows the hair on my head. Our relationship isn't as close as yours. Ours, mine's a little simpler. When I'm in the car, he's in the car with me. When I, walk, when I walk into a group of people, he goes with me. Uh, nothing can ever separate me from him. I don't know how to explain it to you unless you know it. But he is in me and I am in him. And that relationship is never broken. The personal presence of God in your life. That's the problem with being religious as opposed to being born again. You can be religious and not know a personal presence with God. But when you've been saved and God comes into your life, you have that personal relationship where, where you just feel knitted to him and glued to him and never without that wonderful touch. Why do I say that? I say that because this is what Joshua was saying. Joshua was saying, fellas, you can do what you want to do, but as for me. And Joshua in his mind is remembering the past faithfulness of God. And, and he's enjoying the, 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 the present uh, experience and need and, and security of God. And, and he knows that God is going to care for him. And, and to Joshua, even though he is surrounded by millions of people, it's just him and God. Have you ever had that experience? Millions and millions and millions of moments in my life, but it's me and you, God. And Joshua says, as for me, this is what I'm going to do. I want to show you three passages. Joshua chapter 1. Come to Joshua chapter 1. And we'll come to Joshua 21 and in Joshua 23. Oh, I hope and pray that God is working this in your heart. I'm almost finished. Joshua chapter number one. Look, if you would, please, in verse number two. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people under the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place, remember this, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even under the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, under the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. So as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not, say that word please, fail thee nor forsake thee. Great promise God made to the nation of Israel. The book of Hebrews says he made that great promise to you and to I. And that was God's promise to Joshua. Come if you would to chapter number 21. I need you to see this great passage of scripture. Joshua chapter 21. Pick up if you would please in verse number 43. He's nearing the end of his life. And Joshua recounting what God has done says in 2143, and the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein, just like God said he would do, God did. And the Lord gave them rest round about, according to all that he sware unto their fathers. Twice Joshua is, is rehearsing this. There stood not a man of all their enemies before them, just like he promised in chapter number one. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand, just like he promised. In verse 45, there failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord has spoken unto the house of Israel. Say that last phrase with me. All came to pass. Go to chapter 23, please. Chapter 23, as you look at uh, verse number 11, powerful Joshua here getting ready to present himself in this declaration in chapter 23. He says, take good heed therefore unto yourselves that ye, say that word please, love the Lord your God 
else, if you do in any wise, go back. There's always been this push for God's people to go back instead of going forward with the Lord. If you do any wise, go back and cleave unto the remnant of these nations, even these that remain among you and shall make marriages with them and go in unto them and they to you. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations. They'll lose their power. But they shall be snares and traps unto you and scourges in your sides, thorns in your eyes. There be no peace with them until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God hath given you. He's warning them, verse 14, and behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. That means he's dying. And you know in all your, what class? Hearts and in your soul that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. And God's people said, I submit to you that really and truthfully you can take the complexity of your life And you can reduce it down into a simple moment. As for me. As for me. God, I I, I don't have answers to that. I don't see how we're going to make it here. God, I'm drowning here, man. I'm in trouble. I'm hurt. I'm broken. I've got all of this going on. But as for me, I know you're good. I know you love me. I know you've never failed your word. You've been faithful 100%. God, the whole world can go do what it wants to do. But as for me, I choose you. And folks, 23 years of ministry and hopefully another 100 to go, that's the summation That's the summation. God, my marriage is a mess. But as for me. God, my job is, but as for me. God, our finances, but as for me. Oh, God, the emote, but as for me, Lord. Look, if you would, please, at verse number 28, Joshua 24. So Joshua let the people depart, and every man unto his, what's that word? Inheritance. Inheritance. Who gave them that inheritance? God did. And Joshua said, fellas, I've said my peace. You can serve the gods of this world, or you can serve the true and living God. That's up to you. And let me just stop here. God didn't give this to me in the 830, but he's given it to me now. You can't make people walk with the Lord like you walk with the Lord. You can't. And sometimes you're not even going to win those people. You're not going to convince them. Those people have a mind made up that they're going to go a direction, and that's just the direction they're going to go. And they can do that. But if God is in you and you love God and and you walk with God, then then basically it just boils down to what do you want to do? What are you going to do? Pastor, if I choose God, I'll lose everything. My friend, Jesus said if you lose your life for him, you'll find life. Joshua said, go home, fellas. Make your choice. But Jesus is the right choice every time. As a little boy, I was the oldest of four children. My brother is 18 months behind me. My sister Amy's five years behind me. She just had a birthday. Uh, I think she's 39. She's 39. I'm 44. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit this to you, but I was a mean brother. I know you don't believe that looking at me today. I was mean. I'll never forget my brother and I. 
my dad, I love him, but sometimes I think about what he did. What dad buys his boys boxing gloves for Christmas? A great one. Sugar Ray Leonard got us a couple of red boxing gloves. He said, boys, just don't kill each other. Man, we boxed and we boxed. But I was a little older than Aaron, and so I was able to dominate that. He could crush me today. And I had mercy. Aaron didn't even, couldn't spell the word, nor did he understand the word. <laughs> and so we would be fighting, and I would get on top of Aaron, and I would take my hand, and I would literally mash his face into the carpet, and I would say, I've got you. You're going to quit, right? I've got you. You're going to quit. And he went, and I said, you better not. I'm gonna, and I would stand up, and I would turn away, and he would stand up, and he would slug me in the back as hard as possible. Um, let's just say that I sent him to the hospital probably three times, one of them without his teeth, a couple of times with stitches. So he hit me over the head one time with a gun. It was on a Sunday afternoon. I'll never forget that. I walked into the kitchen. I couldn't have been 10 years old. I said, Mom? Are the hospitals open on Sunday? <laughs> she said, why? I said, look, <laughs> you know, here we go. Here we go. So we had them boxing gloves. And Tom, Aaron kept saying, I, just let me hit you once. Let me hit you once. You're always hitting me. Let me hit you one time. Okay. Go ahead. Hit me. You won't move? I won't move. Hit me with your best shot. And he took one of those big old wind-ups like this. And I don't know, the Lord possessed me, something happened. And I just went, wham! <laughs> he went right against the dresser and down, and I think I got a whooping for that, but it was worth it. I had a good time. <laughs> I was mean to my little sister Amy a lot. And I don't know, she was a girl. So I remember my dad one time, I had crossed the line. He jerked me into his room and jerked a knot in my tail. Now, you don't know what that word means. It just hurts, okay? He said this. He said, Tommy, he said, in this house, we love family. He said, in this house, we choose family. He said, your sister is going to get older and there's going to be, and I didn't know I was a little boy at this time. He said, there's going to be all these outward influences that are going to want to get your sister Tommy, your sister is going to go the way in which she believes she's loved the most. And she said, he said, in this house, she's going to know that she is loved. And you're going to love her, and you're going to choose family every time. I had a little problem, not a little problem, a little discussion with my girls this week. One of them's at college, one of them's in high school. And an outside influence had come up. And it kind of had a chance to pit one daughter against the other daughter. And I remembered my dad, what he said to me about family choosing family. So I got my girls and I said, listen, not in every case, but almost in every case, choose family every time. Don't, don't ever let anything come between family. I want to step over here and I want to give my opinion a second and I'll come back. I want to say that to you. I know you can't always choose family, but you ought to love your family. Amen. Choose your family. I would like to say to every teenager in this room, choose your family. Choose your family. So I brought the girls together, and I said, they asked, what do we do, Dad? I said, choose each other. And I'd like to close you by this. We're part of the body of Christ if we know him. Amen? Amen. Choose family. Amen. Choose family. The devil's going to offer everything. But as for me, I choose you, Lord. Lord, all these opportunities, but I choose you. Life really does reduce down, church to those moments where you got to make a decision. As for me, am I going with God or am I not going with God? And I promise you, he's the right choice every time. Shall we pray?
Heavenly Father, God, I couldn't get any further than as for me. You dominated me with that statement. I began to think about life, and I thought, man, you're really truthfully, the complexity of life can be reduced down to the simple decision. As for me, what am I going to do? Am I going to be unfaithful? Am I going to be sinful? Am I going to be fearful? Am I going to trust the Lord? Outside influences are there. My own fears and inhibitions are there. But at the end of the day, as for me, what am I going to do? I think about somebody thinking about being saved and they're in a group of circle of friends and they're afraid. As for me, what are you going to do? I think about the Christian that's in the middle of tests and trials and the outside influence says curse God and just go away, but what are you going to do? I think about Jesus when he said, are you going to go away also? What are you going to do? I think about my dad saying, Tommy, choose family every time. As for me, Joshua said, fellas, you can go that way if you want to. But as for me, oh, what a great choice. Great choice. Heads bowed and eyes closed. God preaching to you today. And God speaking to you today. You find yourself in a situation. You got a lot of options, a lot of pressure. What are you going to do? Your pastor would tell you and beg you, choose the Lord. No, but pastor, it's just not so simple. Yeah, it is. What are you going to do? You're going to go with God or not? If you go with God, you'll survive. I don't promise you an easy walk, but I promise you a surviving walk. I promise you a surviving walk. Very difficult. I remember sitting in those messages struggling. Almost 30 years later, I'll tell you, I made the right decision. Pastor, God spoke to me today. I find myself in a place where I had to make a decision and I want to choose the Lord in this decision. As for me, I don't care. My other friends may not. My other family may not. People may not. But as for me, I'm, I'm going to go with the Lord on this. Pray for me, Pastor, for courage in this area. If that's you, would you lift your hand? And I pray for you. Pastor, pray for me here. God bless you all across. You can put them down. I wonder, are you saved? Have you been born again? Have you received the Lord as your Savior? Are you sitting there with outside influences you're worried about? As for you, this is a personal decision for you, not your mom, not your dad, not your grandma, your grandpa, your, your wife, your husband, for you. Pastor, I need to be saved. I want to be saved. Today, I'm going to make that decision for myself. Pray for me. Don't embarrass me. But here's my hand. Pray for me, Pastor. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Say, Pastor, I need to be saved. Pray for me. Okay. All right. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts. I believe you're ministering. I feel your presence in this room. Move now, God. Move on our behalf. Folks that said, Pastor, pray for me for courage, they could come forward and fall down and just simply say before you on their knees, Lord, here I am for myself. I choose you today. I choose you today. You know the hearts. I don't. My work is finished. Now you finish your work in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Songs, page number 602. Men of God be here. Ladies of God, some need to come and join the church today for themselves. As for me, we're going to become members. Well, you move now as God would lead you. 602. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided To follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the 
cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still I will follow, though none go with me, still I will follow. Still I will follow, no turning back, no turning back. Even the hymn writer understood the difficulty and the struggle of this decision. Though none go with me, that's how it is with the Lord. The Bible says the broad way leads to destruction, the narrow way leads to life. You're never going to get everybody to go with you. That's not how it works. But as for you... Though none go with me to the mission field, Pastor, God's called me to the mission field, I gotta go. Though none go with me in this area, but I gotta go. Though none go, but I gotta go. As for me, then the songwriter said in the fourth verse, and this is what I want you to see from earlier, will you decide, what's that little word? Now. Remember Joshua said, now. Now, now. Now you can go this way or you can go this way, but make your decision now. As for me, I made my decision. So the songwriter said, Will you decide now to follow the Lord? Let God finish it in your heart. Verse number four, if you would, please. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. All right, our song to go home is page 394, but we have coming forward today Shelby and Lila Fan, and they are sisters. They're right down front here. They were coming forward last week, and I forgot to acknowledge them. And they have moved to our area, and they are uh, been attending our church, and they're coming forward today to present themselves for membership by transfer of letter. If you rejoice with Shelby, and God help us, we got another Lila. <laughs> Say amen. amen. I said that at the 11 o'clock service. Don't tell Lila I said that, Okay. Welcome, girls. Andy Escarcia is coming. Andy has been saved. God's doing wonderful things in Andy's life. He's becoming my friend and my brother in the Lord, and he's coming forward today to present himself for water baptism. If you rejoice with Andy, would you say amen as well? He will not be baptized tonight, but we'll catch him on our next service. Pray for Brother Andy, if you would, that and God would just continue to minister and grow and protect him as he trusts the Lord. He's become a faithful man in the Lord. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. What a great truth to go home on. Lift your voice now, 394. See you back tonight. Come by and shake these hands for these folks that have come forward. Greater is he that is in me Greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God bless you. See you tonight.